Um, I'd like you to know the difference between, uh, when it comes to the Reformation in England, between the actual split with Rome and the actual theological Reformation. They're two separate issues. Ultimately, they result in uh, the coming of the Anglican Church, which in the United States is the Episcopal Church. Uh, there is still some ties to the Anglican Church, the Church of England between America and the United States, but um, a lot of that, what we really call the official tie, um, <coughs> real, a real ecclesiastical tie, disappeared in, after the American Revolution. Uh, the American Episcopal Church became a separate congregation, essentially. Uh, but the theology is the same, and uh, much of the, much of the uh, services is very much the same. Okay, um, so one of the leading figures in putting across not so much the Reformation, but in trying to establish uh, a real political, uh, real political strengthening of Henry VIII's position was someone that, of course, is mentioned in uh, the Simon Schaumann movie, and that's Cromwell. Now, this is not Oliver Cromwell later. This is uh, John Cromwell, and he is a he is a master manipulator and uh, a genuine, genuinely, really evil dude. Uh, all I can say. This is a guy who was quite uh, sinister. Uh, he is the one that framed Anne Boleyn uh, to demonstrate that she had committed treason because she had committed adultery and she hadn't done anything. But he wanted to get her out of the way in order to reestablish a tie, in, in a particular moment, the tie uh, between Henry VIII and uh, Charles V on the continent in order to surround France. Cromwell wanted to pull, pull this thing off, and he, he, but in order to do this, he's got to get rid of the, the, big, the big roadblock here, and that is uh, Henry's marriage to Anne Boleyn. After all, it's, remember, Charles V is what? Holy Roman Emperor. Holy Roman Emperor, and he is the nephew of Catherine of Aragon. Big deal, it's a big deal, yes. So is he hoping that like by bumping off Anne Boleyn that Mary will be like re-legitimized? No, I'm not sure that he's Catherine looking, back or I don't think he's looking for that so much, but he's looking to establish a, a treaty, an alliance between Charles V and Henry VIII uh, that, would, that would encircle France. And that's always the big question, you want to encircle France. Uh, it's, I mean, it was an obsession. Uh, Henry still had the title King of France. Uh, so much for titles. And then uh, at the same time, Cromwell is the engineer behind this. He engineers a couple of things. Uh, he's, he executes a number of individuals that he's accusing of having affairs with the king's wives, not just uh, Anne Boleyn, but other subsequent wives, uh, having affairs and then having them executed. Absolutely total frame, total, I mean, just uh, un totally unscrupulous. Uh, Henry is, I'm not saying Henry's a victim to Cromwell's policies, but I'm saying, but Henry did fall in with them, uh, and they, they do work together, but most people leave Cromwell out of the picture. So I'm glad Simon Sharma talked about this, because uh, Cromwell is a, is a major player at this point. As far as I know, he is no ancestor of the later uh, Oliver Cromwell. Uh, don't, don't think they had, I, I've tried to check this out a number of times because I've had that asked before, and I don't think he is. Uh, maybe a distant cousin, I'm not sure. Okay, so uh, Henry has gone through six wives. He's completed the separation of the church in England from the church in Rome. Uh, Crum, uh, Thomas Cranmer, C-R-A-N-N-E-R, Cranmer has been uh, on board to push as much of a theological reformation as possible during this process, but, he, but he's not going to do it. He can't do it. He can't get past a certain point with Henry. Henry is a, still a conservative Catholic. Uh, he's just not a Roman Catholic. He's, there's no pope here. 
uh, separated from the Pope. He is the head of the church in England. Uh, it's, a, it's a switch at the head, but nothing else. No theology has changed. He's also uh, attempted to outlaw any further publication of the Bible in English, which he sees as a possible, uh, because of stirring up trouble. Uh, nothing can stir up passions is quicker than religion. Uh, and I think this is a, the, a day, the day and age when we can really talk about that and see just how that has occurred. Uh, Religious passions are very, very fast and furious, equally very savage, and you ain't seen nothing yet because Europe is going to break into all hell in just a matter of just a few years as the Reformation takes on a very ugly turn uh, with the wars, the wars of the Reformation, the, the wars of religion. They're going to run basically from about 1540, actually 1530. Uh, the start of the first one in Germany, uh, right down to 1648, the end of the, the Thirty Years' War is the last of the great religious wars, and it's also <coughs> the first of the, of the modern state wars. But religion is tied into all of this, and it's all over the continent. It also spreads to England during the English Civil War. It's all religious motives are there. There's no end to it. it there's no end to the ferociousness and the ugliness of it. Uh, and all done in the name of, of Christ. I mean, it's just like, what are you talking about? That's the way it is. And we very quickly point the finger at, you know, you have wars of religion and Islam today, they're still blowing each other in the mosques and all this kind of stuff. Keep in mind that we did it for 150 years uh, among, among the Christians. Okay. And uh, probably given the attitude of some, they'd like to start right over again. Okay. Uh, so, this can be a very, it has nothing to do with, with religion itself. That's the important thing. Really. It has nothing to do with, with the faith. It has to do with your own personal, whatever the hell's going on with you, uh, sick son of a bitch, uh, probably doing these things. But it doesn't. It, it has nothing to do with any valid uh, point in either Christianity or, or Judaism or Islam. Never. It just doesn't. Okay. We'll be on. Uh, Henry, in his last years, becomes very, he's very overweight, overindulgent. Uh, he's overeaten. There's no question about that. He had a bad injury with the jousting, trying to prove his, his uh, that his uh, testosterone was still working wonderfully. Uh, but he fell off the horse in the jousting match, and it just it, it tore him up. He was dead a couple years later. Uh, he had gout, he had everything else. Uh, and uh, when he died, it's in 1547, uh, England is left now with this great discussion who should take over. And uh, it's really hard, Henry VIII is going to be a hard act to follow. But diplomatically, he did some pretty good things. Uh, he scared the French a few times. He actually invaded France twice, nobody quite knows why. Uh, the last time was in 1544. Uh, he seized actually uh, the city of Cologne. Uh, stayed a couple weeks and then left. It doesn't make any sense. He didn't demand m ransom money like uh, his predecessor, Henry VII, who went to France and stayed there for a couple of months. And the guy goes, What do we do? Pay me off, I'll leave. <laughs> Henry didn't do that. So we're not sure what he was thinking when he did this. Uh, at least I'm not sure. But, so he leaves this interesting heritage. I think what he's trying to say is, you know, by the way, you may not think I'm king of France, but I am still king of France, and I want to, when I want to come here, I can. Even if I, have to, if I have to bring an army to prove a point, which he did. But I think, he, I think he's just trying to maybe prove a point. I'm not sure. It's a strange, it's a strange episode. Uh, but when he dies, there is the, the question, Parliament looks now to the fact that both the female heirs, Mary and Elizabeth, have been written in and out and back in into uh, the succession. But in the meantime, he's had a son through Jane Seymour. Uh, she died about a week after giving birth to uh, Edward, Edward VI, and he becomes now the king in 1547. Under, it's under him 
under his reign, he's only going to rule about, he's nine years old when he comes to power. And he's um, going to reign about six, seven years. It's going to be short. He threw in 1553. Uh, but it's in his, during this period, that England establishes the very first of its overseas uh, merchant companies, and that is the Muscovy Company. M-U-S-C-O-V-Y, Muscovy Company. We talked about that before. Uh, it's during the rest of this ever the sixth. Some five ships were sent to try and find China going, <coughs> going through the Northeast Passage. Well, I guess you could call it a passage, if you could call the Arctic Ocean a passage. Uh, you go up all the way around the tip of Scandinavia, if you're not dead yet, uh, then you make a right turn head into the Arctic, and you're zipping along over the top of Russia uh, until you get to the uh, Kamchatka Peninsula, head, make another right turn, head south, and if you're lucky, you'll find China, maybe. Uh, this is a long trip, and uh, there were some five ships on this little expedition. Well, they never found China, but they landed at, a, at the Russian port of Archangel, just like it sounds, Archangel. Uh, and uh, it's during the reign of Ivan the Terrible. It's about 1549 that they arrive. Uh, Ivan greets them. He sends, a, he sends the representatives to greet them with Archangel, brings them to Moscow. <clears throat> and the English uh, description of the Russians is, oh my god, Listen, we hope we never have to fight these people. They're so fucking big. <laughs> Well, anyway, they were big. And they had these huge, I mean, they wore these huge coats anyway, you know, bearskin coats and big boots and all kinds of crap, and they were smoking God knows what back then. Anyway, uh, and they're big, they're just big. Well, what do you trade for in Russia? With furs, for one thing. So fur, the fur trade takes off here. Wood is another thing. England is running out of wood to build, because everybody's running out of wood in Western Europe. They've been building ships for it frickin' ever. There's, you know, nobody recycles this stuff, right? It works because when a ship sinks, it goes to the bottom. How are you going to recycle it? Yes? Uh, England and Russia have much contact before this? No. No. No contact. Um, what they were, what they, they weren't sure where they landed. Uh, some of the map makers at the time were convinced that we, that the English had not actually found Russia. The area is called the Russian Khanate, but that they had landed in another big state in between called Poland, Lithuania, with one, this, with one country. Uh, that was a huge state in the middle, but it wasn't. It's, it is Russia, named after the Viking Rus, uh, who established the country back in the, uh, about the 11th century. But they had been driven off by the Mongols, and then you had almost a 200 year period where the Mongols decimated all of Russia, including the area, including where Russia is actually born, which is in the Ukraine. Now today, the Ukrainians don't like to admit that they gave birth to Russia, because yeah. they can't stand the Russians. They're two different people. But they're close enough in relationship, so you, when you have these, these Nicene, inner Nicene feuds, uh, they really do hate each other because they're so damn closely related. Uh, so you have, in this case, uh, the Mongols destroyed the city of Kiev. They decimated all of Ukraine. So Russia is going to be reborn in, in, a, in a remote spot, and that's in the Moscow region, far to the northeast of the Ukraine and away from Kiev. Uh, it's the five river system that comes out of near Moscow. The river is going all over Russia, uh, east, west, and north, and south, all the way down to the Black Sea, down to the Caspian, and so forth. So when the Expedition got here, the Muscovy Ex wasn't called the Mus Muscovy Expedition. Uh, it was called the Cathay Expedition, Finding China, that's the old name for China, Cathay. Um, what were they got? They knew they, were, they knew they weren't out of China. That much they knew. Uh, they could tell. <laughs> uh, and Ivan greeted them, uh, gave them everything they needed, continued their progress through Russia, set up trade, 
And then ultimately, down, they were able to trade down the Volga River system all the way to the Caspian Sea. And this particular expedition got to uh, the outskirts of Persia. So this is how far down they're going to wind up going. And they got to, per they got to Persia, they're going to trade uh, for Kerman wool, which, out of which they're going to make uh, these wonderful hats that were made in the later centuries. Uh, very, very fine, fine wool. Uh, trading for jewelry, trading for uh, rare woods, uh, incense, and so forth, that they're going to bring back with them to England. Uh, so the trade, the, the Muscovy Company trade, you're going to have about 11 expeditions over the next century with the Muscovy Company going into Russia, going down the river systems, the Dnieper, Dnieper, Don, the Volga, down to the Caspian Sea, down to the Black Sea, and all at the same time trading both in that and within that area of the interior of Russia, and at the same time the expeditions would stretch into, into Persia and into the Middle East, and ultimately uh, indirectly tap into the trade with India. So this is quite an expedition. Uh, it's going to, this company is going to last right until the 19th century. Yes. What did the English offer the Russians in trade? Um, new technology, weaponry, uh, artillery pieces, uh, techniques in shipbuilding. They're going to offer them uh, guns, things the Russians are going to need, and uh, their Russia has just just broken away from the Mongol yoke and they don't want to go back under it again. So these things are vital for their future. It's also going to be the reason that Russia is going to win uh, the Great Northern War, which is coming up within a century, uh, beating the Swedes in the Great Northern War in the Baltic, uh, because they have weaponry that they didn't have a century earlier. It's provided by the English. It's also the reason that Russia stays connected uh, with England for centuries, because the Russians are able with English providing the technology uh, to keep invaders out of Russia, whether east or west, whether fighting uh, against the Chinese at times, against the Japanese at times, uh, against Poland, Lithuania at times, against Sweden at times, uh, and later against the French, Napoleon's invasion. Uh, it's, this is a very, very big uh, piece of connective tissue between the two countries. They form a very close, uh, say, alliance. Uh, which, is, which benefits Russia, but it benefits England with the raw materials in it as well. Okay, so you have, this is all during Edward VI, and uh, it's a very positive move. Uh, the Muscovy Company will last a long period of time, and ultimately, when the Muscovy Company is no longer able to trade into the Middle East because of banditry in the lower river systems, as you get further and further south in the Volga system, and in the, uh, the Don River, uh, the closing of the Black Sea, the further you get into that, the further south you go, uh, there's more banditry. It's wild, it's the frickin' wild west of Russia. And eventually, they're going to not try to trade into Persia through that system. They're gonna try to trade into Persia through a different system, and I get your question. And that system is going to be uh, coming around, sailing around the Cape of Good Hope, uh, after, let's say, about 1600, uh, and sailing into the waters of the Indian Ocean, this time by, uh, by ocean uh, turf, coming up through uh, Cape Good Hope, and then around into the Indian Ocean, and settling near Goa on the west coast, uh, and at a place called Surat. And there they're gonna open trade with Mon the Mughal Empire, which very advanced Muslim uh, empire at the time, uh, and open trade with them. And that is where the, that's the birth of the biggest company England ever had. That's the East India Company. So all these, these that's, that's still a ways off, but this is where it starts, right here with the Muscovy Company. The Muscovy Company is the reason that the Russians were able to beat Napoleon, 612,000 men invasion of the country in 1812, because of this technology supplied. And it's the reason the Russians got themselves into trouble. They would rather suffer the wrath of Napoleon than give up the trade with England. And when they reopened that trade, that's when Napoleon invaded. So 
coming back to that, we'll pick up some of that stuff later. All right, uh, any, any, you had a question. Yeah. How did they get their ships through the rivers? Were they like the galleys or really big ships? Were These they are barges. Okay. You, ha you anchor your ships. <laughs> they, they lose a lot of ships, by the way, in the Arctic. And, uh, but they use barges to go down the river system. Russia has a very, very big river system. And it's also very, sh they're shallow rivers, and they're wide, and they're slow. And you can just, this is a tailor-made for expansion, tailor-made for trade, uh, moving, moving, a lot of products around, very, very big barges. And uh, it's a work, it was a workable system. Uh, the Volga is one of the biggest, slowest rivers on Earth. It's very wide, not too, not too deep, uh, runs very slow, but it's very effective highway for passenger goods. And that's how Russia colonized Russia. That's how the Russians colonized it. the entire interior basin of Russia is through the river system. They didn't just march. The Germans tried to just march. Uh, they never found the end to it. <laughs> they found the, the wrong end to it. Oh, Russians found that. Okay. So uh, this is one thing during the reign of Henry of uh, Edward VI. Pretty positive move. It, it leads up to, ultimately it leads up to, it has impacts in, in, right in the 20th century, this trade connection with Russia. Now, uh, as far as what's going on in this theological realm, which I won't bother you with that much, but just to say that Cranmer is able, as Archbishop of Canterbury, during the reign of Edward VI, is able to pass a lot of, of what I would call ecclesiastical legislation change the system, change the theology of the church, introduce more Lutheranism and Calvinism into the system, and as such, he creates uh, the Book of Common Prayer, I mentioned that already, uh, establishes the Act of Uniformity in 1549, this is two years into the reign of Edward VI, the Act of Uniformity, that all services throughout England would be held uniformly the same in the English language. And this is the prayer book that would be used throughout. What's this guardian? It's a guardian against certain priests in the church who may try to remain secretly Catholic, conducting Catholic services in the Latin, using the old Catholic prayer books and so forth. They're trying to guard against that act of uniformity. So to violate this was not only considered heresy, it's considered treason. Okay. Uh, next, he writes the 42 articles. I mentioned that last time. Uh, these are articles that explain the theological points of the church in England. And it changes the whole, the bottom of everything. Everything's changed. Uh, this is now a thoroughly Calvinist interpretation. Uh, it's more, I'd say it's more balanced than Calvin. But nonetheless, it is thoroughly Calvinistic in its, in its ideas. Uh, you no longer have sacraments, but instead you have uh, ordinances in the church. Uh, you don't have seven of them, you have two of them. Two ordinances, baptism and communion. And these are considered uh, pretty much symbols. Symbol, they're, they're symbolic acts, okay. Uh, it's written into the system. And then he dies. It's the end of Edward the Sixth. Very unexpected. Uh, 1553. So he's about what 17, somewhere half the same. Uh, they always said that he had a very weak system. That, you know, wasn't well to begin with. Uh, I have no way to substantiate that. Uh, any level, uh, but it did catch everybody by surprise, and Parliament now came to meet and discuss who should now be the heir. It's going to have to be somebody tied to the line of Henry VIII. Well, there was there was also some other contenders like uh, Lady Jane Grey, uh, uh, always relative of the Duke of Northumberland, wanted to put forth her name uh, since she's a sort of a shirt tail relative of the Tudors. Uh, that didn't go over so well. 
I've always, uh, usually when I sign papers in this class, there's always somebody that wanted to do Lady Jane Grey. You know, the 300 person that wanted to do Lady Jane Grey. <coughs> Fascinated with Lady Jane Grey. I have no idea what the fascination is. Maybe you can tell me. Oh, yeah, he could not. Okay, right. He doesn't go, he doesn't be a pub, actually. But here. Uh, comes to Winchester. That's the school he's exchange from there. And uh, Winchester has a pub on the campus. We're just now discussing that. <laughs> they are ahead of us, okay? Right. Except for the toilets over there. They're about done now. Oh, they're good, good. Glad to hear it. Okay. Okay, so um, we have uh, Parliament now discussing this issue, and it, they decided to make a move since Mary was back into the legitimate succession. Uh, Henry had put her back in succession. He had also put Elizabeth back into the succession. Parliament has to make a choice, and they went with the, with the eldest daughter, the eldest claimant. Uh, the daughter of who? Catherine, Catherine of Aragon, right. Uh, she's considered very reasonable. Uh, even tempered. Uh, caring individual. Uh, quite the opposite of her father, Henry VIII. And probably the only area where she had a blind spot was, this, was in terms of those personality traits, was on the issue of religion. On that, she was 100% totally turned off on Protestants. Uh, and she's going to make that very plain, very fast. This is why she's called Bloody Mary. Uh, and first thing she will do is issue a statement, issue actually an edict, that all Protestant clergy, that is all the bishops and the few archbishops, some parish priests will now reconvert to the Catholic Church. Well, this is a fat chance. It's not going to happen. She's going to burn 300 of them at the stake. That's a lousy start to a reign. Uh, just really, absolutely, Parliament's totally stunned here. Uh, the people were upset because they never expected anything like this. And then she took it a step further. She tortured Thomas Cranmer, the Archbishop of Canterbury, burned him at the stake, uh, tried it a couple of times, they finally cooked him. And uh, uh, everybody was, people liked Cranmer because this was a very unobtrusive, uh, humble individual, a real scholar, and to needlessly kill this man made no sense to to most Englishmen. They really turned against her when, this, when she did this. Uh, but she also tortured and killed a lot of other people that were very common. Uh, people just for reading the Bible in English. So this is truly her blind spot. Uh, she married in 1553. She married Philip of Spain. Now Philip of Spain is going to be the future King Philip II. Felipe el Segundo, the main man. I love Philip of Spain. He's just a total, total, I don't know what to think about him. He's just great, though. <clears throat> King of everything. He's the son of Charles V. His grandmother, Charles' mother, was a very infamous individual in Spanish history. Her name was Juana la Loca. Anybody know what that means? Juana la Loca. Juana. Crazy. 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 Joan the Mad. The English called her Joan the Mad. And uh, this was part of his heritage. Uh, so he's pretty. He is a true Habsburg. And when. Charles V dies, the Habsburg Empire is split between Philip II, who gets Spain, Italy, everything that he claimed in the Americas, and the Philippines, and at the same time, uh, in Central Europe, that's going to be claimed by Maximilian, the other Habsburg, so Holy Roman Emperor, Emperor of Germany, 
Austria, Transylvania, everything else. So yes, there is a Transylvania. And uh, this is the month for it, because you know. Keep your TVs on late. We'll see what happens in Transylvania, right? <laughs> okay, very good. Now, uh, Philip II is called Mr. Catholic. Uh, he has no desire to suffer any kind of Protestant communion in Spain or in the territories of his governing. Uh, he will become king of Spain almost immediately after he marries uh, Mary. So while he is married to Mary between 1854, right, 18, between 1554 and 1558, that's the time that they're married. They don't divorce, she dies. But during the four years that they're married, he is considered, he's given the title King of England. Now, you'll never see his name on the English records of the records of kings and queens of England, because it just, this will not show up. It'll show Mary, but it won't show Philip II. He's never recognized by the people of England as being their king. But, it's, but it is official, he's married to her, he's, he is the king, and she bows to his wishes. Uh, in Spain, he has already started the Inquisition against any Protestants, against Jews and Muslims. Uh, this is big time, especially in the south in Castile, and further south down in uh, Andalusia. Uh, the term there for hunting out heretics, they're called uh, crypto, uh, secretly Jews, secretly Catholics, uh, secretly Protestants, uh, secretly Muslims you're a crypto Jew or you're a crypto Muslim or you're a crypto Protestant, whatever it might be, meaning you're secretly that and you're, therefore you're held on charges of conspiring against uh, the Catholic Church. Uh, this was Spanish Inquisition. This was not necessarily proved by the Popes of Rome, uh, but it is a very severe form of religious persecution. He also will carry that Inquisition to the New World. Uh, into Mexico and into Peru and all the Latin America where you have the Inquisition just killing a lot of people that just went there to colonize or to work the gold, work the gold mines uh, or to build new colonies, build new cities, uh, suffering this, this Inquisition. Uh, the Inquisition had a lot of interesting aspects to it. I won't go into a bunch of it, but essentially this is part of the, of the wars of religion. <coughs> and uh, Inquisition is simply a, a way of stealing others' property. If you accuse somebody of being secretly a Protestant or secretly a Jew or secretly a Muslim, you receive the property on the accusation. So your testimony I mean, is going to be very questionable. You're, this is a way to make some money. It's a way to get land. Uh, people that are accused are people who have no Protestant, Jewish, or Muslim sympathies at all. Loyal Catholics are accused in order, to, in order for their property to be confiscated. The king's not getting the property, but the king goes along with the program because he is willing to take a chance that these accusations are correct, and he doesn't want any form of religious heresy in his domain. All right. So he's married to, to Mary. This is a great combination. She's burning the Protestants at the stake in England, and he's going after them with the Inquisition. So it sort of tells you where all where the religious conflicts are heading. They're heading toward major violence, and they will be for a long period of time. They're going to take this violence overseas. They're going to take it all the way with them on uh, the trade routes, clear into the Indies, to China, and Japan. Uh, it's going to have major ramifications in terms of how the outside world looks at Europe. It looks at Europeans, English, Spanish, French, Dutch, who are all fighting each other overseas. And we bring a very bad, we bring a very bad uh, ball game with us into this arena, into the global arena. The age of discovery, the age of exploration turn out, turns out to be an age of great conflict. And it's, we, we, the Europeans go in there with maybe some, some altruistic motive in terms of finding new territories and exploring and so forth. But basically, they're in there to propagandize for their side. 
people who have no idea what any of this is about. And so we really bring colonialism in the early period, and it's going to stay that way probably for the remainder, uh, has a very bad taste for everybody. Because it comes in with such a, a massive amount of conflict that's being brought there that's impacted people, people of India, impacts the people of Persia, it impacts the people of the New World, and it impacts Chinese, it impacts Japanese. Everybody is impacted by this. And it's going to have a big backlash really affects world history in a way most people don't understand. Uh, you can probably see some of this stuff in, in any of you in Sean McEnroe's class, he talks about this stuff, right? He goes into, so it's, it's huge, it's huge. It's one of the, to me, that's one of the, it's one of the most fulfilling, I'd say, uh, examinations of history that you can get into is this, uh, the Atlantic world uh, and the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries. If anybody can take that from Sean, do it, because you're gonna learn a lot of good stuff. Good stuff, mostly unknown stuff. People don't put it together. It's really good stuff. Okay, so she becomes pregnant, that is, Mary becomes pregnant in uh, 1554. And Philip up and leaves, goes back to Spain. Pastor. <laughs> yeah, I thought that's <laughs> Uh, it's a, it doesn't work. She miscarries. And then again in 1557. And he takes off again. Comes back, you know, he comes back. Hits the rack, you know, with Mary. It's great stuff. You know. uh, wonderful. I'm leaving from Madrid tomorrow. See you later. All right. And, uh, you know, he probably just told her he was going out and get a pack of cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> cigarettes and a six pack. She didn't make it back. Okay. Uh, the last time he left, um, she was pregnant, she thought, and it turns out uh, she had a uterine tumor, cancerous tumor, and it killed her. Uh, so she died in 1558. He is now a widower in Madrid. He's no longer considered king of, king of England. And so he will stay in Spain for the duration. He'll remarry and have several children, but the policy will continue exactly the same. He's a believer in a very specific kind of policy. One law, one faith, one king. And I'll get your question. Yeah. Why did he leave? Uh, Spain is warmer. <laughs> Sangria is better there. No, he really, he didn't like it. It was, it was, very alien to him. Yes. So why did he marry Mary? Oh, well, it's a it's a political marriage. Well, I know, but I mean, why did why did they want England? I mean, Charles was already pissed that. No, Mary they thought they could probably bring it back into the fold, oh. yeah, the fold. Uh, and I think he was certainly agreeable to do that. Yeah. I mean, uh, you could be Catholic enough to want to do something dumb like that. Probably. I mean, Protestants do the same thing, so we're all we're all doing it. Uh, dynastic. Did you have a question earlier that I didn't ask? Did no, you answered it. Okay. I mean, you look very familiar. <laughs> All right, so uh, any any questions? Yeah. So the two were related by blood, too, weren't they? Yeah. yeah. They each had six fingers to prove it. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a joke. <laughs> okay. Um, now, Back to Parliament. They felt lucky to have survived Mary's rule. Uh, she really alienated the country with a lot of what she did. And she only had five years to do it, and she did it. This alienation. Uh, yeah. You started off with saying she was very even tempered. She, she was, and this, except for religion. <laughs> okay. I did. I did. So to say, yeah. say that, yeah, yeah. I know what I, I'm going to defend myself. I know what I say. <laughs> well, actually, I never know what I have to say. I lie a lot, and so I make it up as I go, as you all know. <laughs> so uh, they now turn to 25-year-old Elizabeth, and she, where has she been? She's been freaking hiding. Why? 
That's right. And she's a potential rival of uh, her crazy ass sister. Uh, crazy sister, half sister, yeah, Mary. Mm -hmm. So that being the case, uh, she kept a very low profile. Very low profile. And I think that probably saved her life. Uh, there's all kinds of rumors that she was having. She had lovers at this time, at the time she was 25. Really, you know, there's no way to prove any of this stuff, really. There's been no, no real hard evidence to show she, who she ever did anything with. We know there were guys that were very interested in her. And she was good looking. Redheaded, um, very attractive. Probably the only person that was, I think, more of a, more of a catch than her would have been her cousin, Mary Queen of Scots. It was considered a, a, a real beauty. But you know, I don't know. Beauty at that time probably is a lot different than beauty today. I don't know. Um, and I'm apparently I'm no expert. I look at these pictures, I go, God, they all look weird. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, she's 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 got a big strike against her. The Catholic Church, still a big power in Europe, has outright condemned her as a legitimate heir, as a legitimate honor of me, immediately. She's a heretic, meaning she's a Protestant. She's a woman, and so we can overlook that. <laughs> uh, and right away, she was excommunicated. Well, I don't think she cared because she was never really raised a Catholic. I'm not sure what impact that has on a non-Catholic. You're excommunicated. It's like saying, well, I wear tennis shoes, and you tell me I can't wear sandals. Well, so what? You know, it just, it doesn't, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but that, there it is. And she is also considered uh, totally unqualified for the throne, okay? Uh, which means she starts off her reign totally condemned by the Catholic Church as illegitimate, a heretic, and you name it. So she, where does that put her in terms of her footing in relation to the Catholic cause in England? It's not good. If you're a Catholic living in England, and you're hoping for some kind of reconciliation, and you just went through the reign of Mary, you try to kill the Protestants off, uh, at least the clergy, and you're hoping for some kind of reconciliation or some kind of a, let's say, a major uh, alteration in terms of how you're treated as a Catholic in England, you're going to be, you don't want to alienate this new queen. Now, nobody really knows her temperament yet, much of anything else about her. She's kept a very low profile. Uh, she's very bright. And the book I want you to, the book that you have for the class by Christopher High on Elizabeth I's Profiles and Power, uh, it's a different kind of book. He takes the position that she is basically uh, very manipulative, very, uh, she's not a great queen. But she learned how to manipulate everybody, including especially men, and how to uh, uh, succeed uh, through intrigue and moving people around. I mean, a lot of stuff that he goes into that really takes away from, I think, I, what I think is a very interesting and uh, quite a good, quite a good monarch in England. And that's, uh, I think, Elizabeth one of the best monarchs England probably ever had in terms of active monarch. I mean, today you don't have you don't have the same issues because. Yeah, this is to reign but not to rule. Uh, is is decision that goes back a little ways now, but at the same time, at that time you 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 ruled and you reigned. You did both. You really called the shots, and she's damn good, very good. Okay, so she's got to deal with that. She's also got to deal with the fact that the Catholic Church says somebody else is more qualified to be the Queen of England. Guess who that was? Mary Queen of Scots. Mary Queen of Scots.
because she's Catholic. She was widowed by Francis of France. She returned to Scotland uh, right at the same time that, that Elizabeth becomes Queen of England. That Mary has returned to Scotland. She is uh, at Holyrood Palace near Edinburgh. Uh, her husband, Bosworth, uh, Boswell his name, not Bosworth, Boswell, uh, was a real, uh, apparently a total turd. And uh, he used to, you know, he was out cruising around every night with his buddies and never came home and was having sex with everybody but her. And so, uh, Eventually, um, she began having an affair with the court musician in Edinburgh, named Rizzio, uh, R I Z Z I O, and uh, you know those Italians. Can't trust them. What are you doing here? I'm here. I've, I've come to play the banjo. <laughs> I see. What is that thing hanging out of your pocket? That's a piece of the banjo. Anyway, can't trust them. Uh, so one night, uh, some of Boswell's friends broke into the palace bedroom and murdered him right in front of her. Uh, some weeks later, he was put outside of, of the castle himself, outside of Holyrood, uh, in, a, in a small cabin because he had broke out with the pox. And, uh, the cabin accidentally, sort of coincidentally, blew up. Um, Gunpowder, and that's the end of that's the end of Boswell. Well, three weeks later, uh, she marries somebody else who was in on the plot to, to kill to kill her husband. So you're killing everybody, and finally, both Protestants and Catholics in Scotland decide she's got to go. She's a liability. She just, I mean, she's really, you know, she's great looking. But she doesn't have an ounce of common sense. And so she escapes to England and she's never she never comes back to Scotland again. Once she when she leaves Scotland, they, let, they, never, they never let her back in. Well, the Catholic Church has decided that Mary Queen of Scots should be the Queen of England. Why? Because she's Catholic, that's it. She is the great granddaughter of Henry the Seventh. Remember Henry the Seventh? Henry VII had taken his, his daughter Margaret and had her married to James IV of Scotland, and this Mary Queen of Scots is the granddaughter of that union. So she's related directly back to Henry VII. This is a this is a good Tudor dynasty. Uh, if you if you want this, yes. So was this probably the only time in this era that both Protestants and Catholics were like? We can't stand this person. Yeah, that, that she sort of just she just was a liability on either side. Um, the Catholics, the Highlanders, supported her because she was Catholic, and they are Catholic. They are today. The Lowlanders, Edinburgh and below, down to the English border, were all Church of Scotland, Presbyterian Church. Calvinists. They're the ones that greeted her at the boat when she landed in Scotland. They're the ones that came up rip-roaring with the bagpipes and, and condemned her, both her sex and her religion. It was a great start. And the leading preacher was a, a, a total maniac, Protestant maniac named uh, John Knox. There's a lot of Presbyterian churches with that name, Knox Presbyterian Church, Knox Theological Seminary, God forbid. And then uh, he was just Screaming, a total screaming, you know, narrowly focused, what? I can't think of anything quite like it today. Nothing quite like it. Uh, that's who condemned her. So she felt at ease with the Catholics in Scotland. But the Catholics in Scotland did not live in her vicinity. They lived in the, to the north, in the highlands, up around Inverness and that area, where my people came from. I think they got lost when they got here, to be honest. <coughs> How about the islands in the north? Were those uh, the Isles mostly Catholic? Yeah, Isle of Skye and all the, the yeah, 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 almost 100 percent Catholic. Uh, that's still true. Still.
Still true. Um, so, but once she, you know, was involved in the murder of her husband and a few other things, uh, they gave up on her. Everybody gave up on her. So there was no great parades to try to bring her back to Scotland. But when she gets to England, she soon becomes a liability for, for Elizabeth, who's very, just become queen. And besides, she's cuter than Elizabeth. Can't have that. So this is, no, you can't have that. Uh, so, I mean, there's a lot, there's some real, some real issues there. She's going to be accused of plotting to overthrow Elizabeth at least 20 times during the time she lives there. Uh, she will die and she will be executed, ultimately, uh, in 1587. And a year later, uh, because of that, it's said by some, because of that, Philip II of Spain launches his great military expedition against England to vindicate Mary, the Spanish Armada, based on the fact that he is looking to avenge the death of Mary, Queen of Scots, whom he considered to be the, the real Queen of Scotland, real Queen of England. So it's a very, it's, I'll cover all that. So she comes to power and she's got a lot of suitors. Everybody's claiming to have a, a relationship with her. Nothing, nobody has really ever demonstrated that they had a serious relationship with her. She may have had one, one only, and it was a little bit later in her reign. Elizabeth has seen, and this is what I like about her, she has seen the chaos that's going, that's raging through here. The war of religion the intolerance of both sides. Uh, she looks at King Philip of Spain, whose policy becomes the policy of the King of France as well. One law, one faith, one monarch. One law, one faith, one king. What that means is, my political power is tied to my religious power as the king, and I am a Catholic, and Protestants need not apply to live here, to be a part of this, to be part of this, this reign, to be part of this, the goodness of this reign. One law, one faith, one king. It's total intoleration of any, uh, let's say, any alternative position on any side. And the Protestants were doing the same thing. You'd already had the the demarcation line running across the German states called what? The Augsburg Line, 1530. Lutherans to the north, Catholics to the south. You had very similar lines drawn when you had Calvinist states set up in Presbyterian Scotland. The Puritans in England were beginning to claim they had the truth only. Uh, you had the Dutch Reformed Church operating out of Holland saying, get rid of the Catholic king. You had the French Huguenots trying to expel the French king, the French army, off the coast of France. So all of these were very explosive uh, issues at the time that she becomes the queen. How she deals with this, to me, is, a, is really an amazing process. Because what she does, what she picks up here, is she's su suggesting that there's got to be a better way. You can't just keep killing off your subjects because you disagree with them. We have the world be dead all the time if we were if we were to act like this. So her her view is what's called the Elizabethan Compromise. The Elizabethan Compromise, which she develops very very early, is that she will not examine anybody. torture anybody to find out what they really believe. All she asks you to do is, as a subject of the realm, attend the Anglican Church. What you do in private, what you believe in private, we will not torture out of you or try to examine you. To show the outward sign by going to church, okay? And if you don't do that, you're going to be fine. There's a debate about the fine. It was, not, it's a, it was a heavy fine. Some folks say it's very heavy. Others say it's not. It was a very light fine. I don't know. I can't get a real interpretation 
a consensus interpretation on this thing. So, opposing the idea of one law, one faith, one king, one ruler, is the, is the compromise. Within the compromise, you will not be examined for conscience sake as long as you attend the state church, the Anglican church. She then goes further and begins to now tamper with the language of the church. She no longer says that she is head of the church, like Henry. She says that she is governor of the church. That's a very clever comment. She's governor, not head. Say, so what's the difference? Well, if you're a Catholic, who's the real head of the church? Who's the real head? The Pope. And she's saying now she's not the head of the church. She's governor of the church in England. That led many Catholics to think she's really Catholic. They're beginning to, what, what, what people will do is read into her, she makes a, a very vague statement here. Very vague. In which you can read it, read into it anything you want to. Interpret it any way you want. Was well, exactly what she had in mind. Just take it for what you think it is. The Protestants thought she was still very Protestant, and the Catholics now think she's probably Catholic. So everybody seems happy. She then takes the words of the celebrating the communion in the thirty in the uh, forty-two articles. She removes three of those articles, so it's thirty-nine articles, and one of the ones that she removes talks about the issue of the symbolic act of communion. She said it's not symbolic, but it is basically the body and blood of Christ is transformed. Hold it a minute, stop the clock, stop the music. What are we talking about? What, what the, what's transformed? It's not transubstantiation exactly, but it sounds like it. It's definitely not just symbolic. There's more to it than that, but it's not transubstantiation. Everybody's looking at each other. What does she mean? Well, as long as I don't get hung, it don't matter, does it? Okay, just don't make sure you don't. Go to church, shut up, read the Book of Common Prayer, accept what transform means, and enjoy it. You will not be judged for whatever you believe personally. You cannot be arrested, held in prison, tortured, burned at the stake, or anything else for what you believe inwardly. You'll never be examined for that. Europe was doing that constantly. Persecution in France, persecution in Spain, persecution in the Holy Roman Empire. Everybody's killing, everybody's killing everybody all the time. Not here. You will not be examined. But if your religious beliefs, which I have not questioned, I haven't examined you, we haven't tortured you to find out what they are, but if those religious beliefs lead you to political treason, it's your ass. If you, because you are secretly a Catholic, decide to join in on a plot to remove me from as Queen of England, because of your Catholicism you want to change rulers, and I find out about it, you're dead. But I'll never go after you unless you do that. And even after the number of times that Mary was accused of this while living in England, Mary was accused of this, she didn't want to, she didn't, she didn't go after her. It's only at the very end, after a number of years, that finally she says, enough is enough is enough, and had her executed. So this is a different, this is a policy of what? Toleration. Whereas the rest of Europe was still 
in the throes of intoleration at, at very best. How bad is it, get, is, it, is it going to get? The king of France declared war on his Protestant subjects on the coast, on the Huguenots. And right in the middle of the reign of Elizabeth, in the year 1571, the French king massacred thousands of his subjects on the coast in what's called the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre of 1571. Is religion important in this day? You bet. It's the, it's, it's the prime mover. Philip II has launched his great inquisition, both in Spain and in the New World. Thousands being burned at the stake, thousands being tortured, and so forth. Intoleration, one law, one faith, one king. My way or the highway. Intoleration. Catholics having to flee northern Germany to move to the southern German states to get into states that are Catholic. Otherwise, they'd be killed. Lutherans having to cross the line and move northward to Germany in order to get out from under Catholic kings that are going to kill them. Philip II declares war against his Protestant subjects in the Netherlands sends a 100,000 man army against him to, to go after him. And ultimately, that's going to culminate in the great Spanish Armada of 1588 when Philip sends his entire fleet plus 100,000 men to the, to the Netherlands is a knockout punch against three groups, the French Huguenots on the French coast. He's going to kill them. Attack the Netherlands, destroy their leaders, bring the Netherlands back into the Catholic fold under because it's under it's under Spanish control. But they were they had revolted. And finally the last thing the Armada was to do was to then sail across the English Channel using hundreds of barges for troops and some 300 ships, big Spanish, big Spanish galleons, 200 guns apiece on these ships, in, in the Armada to knock out England. It was a three-pronged punch. Take out, you take out the, again, take out the French Huguenots on the coast, with cooperation of the King of France, because he's also what? He's also Catholic. You take out your rebellious Dutch Calvinist subjects. Then you load your troops on barges and move them across the channel. Just like that. 